Hello, and thank you for joining us on the Exploring Consciousness Podcast. And welcome to another episode with your co-host, Donna Revita, and me, Natasha Williams. Co-host, Natasha Williams, and our special guest, Raymond O'Brien. Welcome, you two, to our podcast. Thank you. Thank you. So glad to have you here. Let me tell you just a little bit about Raymond, who are, who is our guest today. Raymond is a natural born medical intuitive and has worked with the medical profession to help NDE survivors, near death survivors, to try to process the psychological ripples that come through such an event. And Raymond died 10 times one night and has had other, other multiple near death experiences. And for further introduction to Raymond, please go to the Monday podcast where I do a whole long introduction of who this special guest is with many talents. Thank you. What we're going to do today is we're going to structure the interview along four talking points. Before, who he was before his NDA, NDE, and then what the heck was the NDE that he had that, that night? Um, and then the trauma and everything that he experienced after the NDE and what he's doing now. So um, we've got to get that all in within one day our podcast. <laughs> so Raymond, please, we're going to let you have free reign here on your family, who, who you were before, and then during your NDE. So welcome, Raymond. Well, thank you. Thank you, ladies. First off, thank you so much for inviting me. It's, it's, it's a real pleasure to, uh, to, give, to give interviews. And, uh, and can I just congratulate you both on, on the structure of, of your interviews? Just, it's, it's amazing. It's very rare for me to get this kind of structure. And, uh, so I always maintain uh, the much better the structure, the much better the answers. So thank you both. It's, you, I can clearly you've taken some time to do that. So thank you. I really, it's greatly appreciated. Uh, who was I before my, my event? Oh, my gosh. Um, first off i have to say i wasn't a nice chap uh, that, that's that's my personal opinion um i did you know on reflection there i didn't really like who i who i was um i came from a family of seers on my mother's side um particularly on my mother's grandmother's side um it wasn't something that was spoken of very much to be quite honest. it was very quiet I, I remember my father had spent uh, almost 30 years in the armed forces here within the UK. And uh, we used to, we lived in, in quite, quite a few places. Uh, but one place particular that made me really latch on to, um, I remember we were driving down from up north uh, for a new posting in, in, in Middle England. And um, it was at the time where there was no Google Maps. You know, everything had to be done off a, off, 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 off a paper map. And, uh, and everything that, that 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 brought into into play my father was the kind of man who the last resort was if if he his last resort was that he had to ask for direction so he was he was a proud irishman so you can imagine the arguments of we should have gone left we should have gone right mm -hmm. so um we're, we're in, in the middle of rural england middle middle england looking for this army base which was in, in the middle of nowhere and surrounded by trees so it was very hard to find and we're driving up and down these country lanes off a, a, a long drive from, from up north. And um, I remember the arguing starting. I was sitting behind my mother, my brother's to my left, my father was 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 to the right driving. And mum um, kept saying, left here, right, right here. And he kept looking at her thinking, how, 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 how do you know you haven't got a map? And uh, we've ended up in, in, in the middle of nowhere and hedgerows which are eight nine ten feet high so we, we had no perspective of where we were and and honestly natasha on honestly donna we just ended up right at the front of of, of the guard house and uh, i remember my dad looking at my mum and, and, he, and he said to her how did you do that how, how did you know mm -hmm. and, and she just looked at him she just went i just i just knew and i remember sitting behind her going that's what i want to do I want to do what my mum was doing. Mm -hmm. So before before all of this, and uh, we we were based in Germany, and uh, my mum was uh, was 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 a German national, and uh, a German German Jew, and um, the family was 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 persecuted, uh, as 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 many were during the Second World War, but there was an old lady who used to live with us called Omar, 
and she had a very special place and every Sunday in Germany it was a special moment when you'd had Sunday dinner you'd go out to these ornamental gardens you'd have a walk around you'd say hi to everyone well I, I remember going out with with my mum and we stopped at this old lady she was all dressed in black great big black rimmed hat with a black veil black gloves and, and a walking cane and, and a stoop and I was very young at this time probably five or six and um, mum was having an argument with with this old lady called Omar as I say and um, they stopped talking and I remember looking at my mum and said what was the argument about and she said Omar said it was time for you to start your teaching and that you had to go with Omar to be taught she said but you're to stay with me and um, so I, I thought oh, oh, okay um, it was it was normal to me um, I, there was lots of other events up to that, uh, up, up to that moment when I was, uh, I, I, remember, I even remember the birthing room and I, I explained it to my mother about how cold it was, the colour of the tiles and, you know, she was looking at me thinking, how on earth did you remember all this? But, but I did, I didn't remember being slapped, thankfully, but I do remember how cold it was. And um, so um, she, uh, she, she so, so we had all these very strange experiences, light beings, I remember seeing them, we used to play around um, the drains at the back of the house and they, they were very tall you used to look up at them and they were very bright but I had to I had the ability to look at them so I, I, I still don't know to this day what they were but I do believe that I dream about them quite quite a lot uh, and um, so that was kind of like the brief you know the very brief of, of what was running within the family I have two other brothers and I have a younger sister the two brothers are, are, are older than me um, also very skillful um, but I don't think they had much time to practice as, as I had. Um, so fast forward again. Um, I mean, I'm in a stage of life where I knew I had to change, but I didn't want to change. Mm. So I turned to alcohol and drugs uh, to, to, to blank everything out, basically. Um, my mum had came from a family of 13. And um, so my mum's brother came over to visit her. I must have been about 21, 22 ladies. And uh, I opened the door. His name was Dieter. I opened the door. And uh, I, I remember looking at him thinking, there's something very different about you. And um, Dieter came in. Um, my German wasn't that great, but everybody else's was, was, was very good. Um, but there was something about Dieter that, that put me off. Mm. And I, I kept away from him. And uh, Dieter had done time in prison. He was an alcoholic. And, uh, but I didn't understand why he chosen that 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 kind of life with the skills that he clearly had. Um, but I soon found out why, and um, I was going in the same direction as as Dieter. I didn't seem to have a choice to be a seer. It was something that just kept blossoming within me. I started to see illnesses on people. Um, I, I, I I would have a real connection with animals, um, but at, at the time. Um, I couldn't handle it, so this is how I turned to drink and drugs, to really drown it all out. Um, I had a very fractured working career. Um, eventually, I became a truck driver, uh, a semi truck driver. I used to go and, and um, to, to, to live all, all over all over England, um, and then I became a gas engineer. And I remember working in London with her, with a lovely lady. We 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 used to service the appliances once a year and we went to this old lady's house and the old lady knew knew my boss her name was michelle and um, michelle asked her how she was and the old lady happened to say that she had a, an earache and michelle the, 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 they had a nickname for me this is called me voodoo ray and um so she said well you're very lucky because we have voodoo ray here today she said i'll service the boiler ray she said and if you can work on on the old lady oh okay uh, so I worked on the old lady I put my hand to her ear where she had the, the had, had the pain um, her pain stopped after we'd finished we put all the tools away and then we walked back down to, to the van and I used to smoke used to smoke 60 cigarettes a day at, at that time and uh, yeah, yeah very much into my uh, tobacco and we sat in the in, in the van and, and, and she looked at me she put her hands over the steering wheel she looked to my left and she went voodoo how do you do that and do do the gas work and uh she said i i i, I, I don't know how you do that um 
Uh, but I didn't tell her that I was already into drugs and alcohol to try to bury what was going on. It was my little dark secret. Uh, and um, my mother was already aware of, of where I was with, with my skills. She knew that I wasn't paying attention to it. She knew that, that, that I wasn't using it the way that it should have been. I was very corrupt in the way that I was using it. Um, so there I am sitting in, in the van with my boss and uh, I knew I was at a precipice of, of you, you have to do something. You either continue on the lifestyle that you have or whatever else is going to happen to you. And I didn't know about any heart issues. I had no, all I knew that my, my father had, had a heart his, history. My mother did too, but I, I didn't connect, connect the dots. And, um, as, as you don't. And, um, I was, I was, I was away. I was, um, I was, I was asked to come away because it was on a bit of a world, world tour trip and it included looking at some horses and ending up in Santa Barbara. And I uh, met a guy called Roger Ford who, who operates out of Santa Barbara called Healing in America and a uh, really nice guy. So I thought I'll, I'll pop in and see Roger. But before I'd left, I, I had been asked to, um, to look at some horses um, i looked at five horses it was the first real thing that i'd done for animals on on a serious level um i'd always kind of looked out the corner of my eye but kept my my seeings to to myself um the first horse i looked at came really quick second third fourth horse the fifth horse i got to uh, was the horse called sparky and uh, i couldn't see anything wrong with sparky and i panicked because the owners were also there too and uh, so I wanted to impress and I, I, I stole for time and said, I don't know what's wrong with, 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 with Sparky. So I'll, I'll ask Sparky. And I said, this not Sparky. I don't know what's wrong with you, but you know, I'm, I'm, there's a big chance that I could end up looking a bit of a fool. So if you could tell me what's wrong with you, I'd very much appreciate that. So he tells me he's blind in his, in his, I think it was his left eye or his right eye. I can't remember. And, um, the other owners said, yeah, you're remarkable. You spotted previous operations. You're, you're correct about this horse. So, um, uh, but she said, but, but Sparky, no, I'm afraid he's not blind. Sparky's just been, been around the world show jumping and, you know, there's nothing wrong with him. So there I am, three o'clock in the morning in New Zealand. And I get a text message of the owner of Sparky. Uh, she said, I thought I should, I sh should let you know that we've had to take Sparky to the optometrist. He, he kept bumping into things. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they've had a look at him and it turned out that Sparky had a detached retina of, of, of the eye. So there was, there was no way I could have known. So, um, okay. So we've gone on from, we've gone on from New Zealand, hit Santa Barbara. And I remember it was the Circle Bar B Ranch. And the, the owner was called Bill, and he asked me why was I here, and I, I gave him a, a brief explanation. He said, you should go down to the stables and uh, have, a, have a chat with Mike, uh, the stable hand deal, have a look at the horses there. So I'd, I'd done the same, went, went and had a look, and uh, pointed out what was wrong with the horses, asked him if he knew before I started. He said, yeah, I work with the horses every day, I know what's wrong with them. So I asked his permission, I went into the corral, worked on the horses, uh, came back, told him what was wrong with the horses, and uh, he was he was he was a bit blown away, to be honest with you, uh, which disturbed me again. Um, he took his hat off and he slapped his thigh and he, and he called me. He was a he was a Scottish cowboy. He was from Glasgow. And, um, <laughs> he slapped his he slapped his thigh and he said, "Boy, he said you you have to get out of here." He said uh, he said you learn you learn millions. And I thought well, I wasn't really interested in the money. I was still kind of like, who am I? Uh, I still don't know who Raymond O'Brien is. And um, so we had a bit of a laugh and a joke. And I uh, went off to see Roger Ford. Had an, he said the same to me, you have to get out here, you know, with the skills that you've got. And, um, so this is all pre-death. This is all pre-cardiac pre, pre arrest. Um, I was on the lovely island of Rarotonga, and that's when I had my first heart attack. Uh, but I didn't know, didn't know what it was. I remember being curled up in the fetal position on, on the couch, thinking there's something not right, something not right. So we made it, made it back home. Um, fast forward a few months, and uh, this was May two thousand and nine. Uh, March two thousand and nine. To apologise, and uh, it's not been back long. About three or four months. Uh, I've noticed the ankles are swelling and all that, all that kind of stuff. And um, and I was on a job, um, and I was driving home on a, on a Wednesday, 
that um, I was, I'd, I'd spoken to, to a client who I'd just left. Um, he was asking me what was wrong with him. And I explained to him about being a seer and, you know, the, pointed out things that was, was, was wrong with his wife and, and, and so forth. And um, so that, that was, that was kind of, kind of, kind of how it was. And um, I, I, I carried on working with horses, uh, working with animals. Um, and then my mother said to me, you have to change, change the way you are. And uh, she said, something bad is going to happen to you. Mm. And I, I remember saying to her, well, mum, it has to be pretty bad because, you know, some of the things I've done have been quite bad. Uh, she said, oh, well, she said, it will be. She said, it will be bad. She said, you need to change. But I, I didn't understand how to change. I didn't know what change was was to entail. I, I don't think who, who could who could help me with that one? Um, I knew I was out of control. I knew why I was drinking. I knew why I was I was um, doing drugs. I, I knew that, uh, and uh, I didn't want to be a seer. I, I just didn't. I just wanted to be a gas engineer and, and not see things on people, not hear things talk to me. Uh, and uh, but that that wasn't to be the way. Um, and that was when Dita turned up. And um, I knew that I was like him, and and I knew now why he was drinking an awful lot and spent time in prison. Prison was his home. He knew that nothing could be, he couldn't be touched uh, if he was in prison. He would probably be very very beneficial to other prisoners. With with his, he, he also used his hands, you know, to take away pain. Um, so it all made sense to me. But it was a direction that I didn't want. I couldn't afford to take. And uh, I suppose really already I was getting set up for that cardiac arrest moment and already being sort of played for it. Uh, um, and then uh, I remember driving home and, and being told it was the voice. And I, I'd use the words of um, Pete Panagall. Uh, he said the voice with a capital V. And I said, yeah, yeah. Uh, the voice spoke to me and it literally said as I'm driving home, you're going to die. Now, I, I wouldn't normally listen to anything like that, but what happened a couple of weeks beforehand with being a seer is, is that it was I, was, I was a natural seer. There was no need to sit down and learn. It was already in there. It just kept coming out um, and learning by my mistakes, basically. And my mum gave me a few tips on, on what I should and what I shouldn't do, but that was really as far as it went. Um, the, the rest of the, of, of the training, the learning came from another voice I, ladies i can't tell you what the other voice was but it was something else um so yeah th there i was trying to stay away from all of this uh, the voice told me i was going to die um i had a premonition a couple of weeks beforehand that i was going to run a child over just as i was going off to work uh, and uh, i had this premonition and i remember the police were doing spot checks I remember just being being in, in, in the traffic jam, just sort of looking over the road, saying, I wonder why they're doing spot checks. And this voice said to me, what would you do if, if, if you ran a child over? This was in the morning. And I, I was thought, oh, my God, I, I, I don't know. The only measures I could do would be to slow down. You know, if, if I'm in, a, in, a, in, a, in, in England, the, the streets are very tight. And, uh, so you don't get a lot of distance of, of, of viewing. And uh, I was driving home and I see the child out the corner of my eye. She was six years old. She ran out to the street and my vehicle hit her. Bang. She came up the bonnet, up the side of the window jam and landed on, 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 the, on the side of the pavement. I got out. Thankfully, I listened to the voice. Um, it told me to slow down. So I slowed down even more slower than I would normally have in, in, in this tight little road. And, um, and she had a little tiny cut on her arm. Yeah, so the police were involved and, and everything else, uh, but but it was that was what made me think about the voice when it told me you're going to die. I, don't, I put the two together, and I, and I thought this is a message here. You know? So it rattled me so much that when I got home, I rang my mum. Now I wasn't getting on well with my mum at this point because I wasn't doing as my teacher was telling me to do. And mum was very disappointed uh, that I, I could tell that. So as I spoke to her on the phone. Uh, she says to me, "Na, was machst du denn? What's wrong with you?" And uh, I said, "Mum, I've just been told I'm, I'm going to die." Who, who told you? She said. I said, "The voice," and, and she said, "Nothing else." So this was after the warning. Bear in mind the warning: something bad is going to happen to you. And, and, and she left it at that. And, um, and that was on a Wednesday. And then 
Sunday is when it all started. That was when um, divine intervention kicked in, I suppose. That was when it, everything went otherworldly. Um, I'd already been at work. My, I, I had my own business, heating and plumbing. And I was a gas engineer. I used to spend a lot of time on site. Um, couldn't understand why I'd found everything so difficult to do. It was like wading through water. Everything was such an effort. And obviously it was my heart slowing down. Um, I would stop breathing at night uh, and then wake up startled. Uh, partners with at the time said, you, you, you freak me out. You just stop breathing. And then, and then you start again. It's like, I don't, I don't know. Um, so um, Sunday, Sunday came. Uh, and uh, that was when it when it all started. I had had my own cat, a Mr. B, who I'd, I'd saved his life beforehand. He was being attacked by a dog, and I beat the dogs off. And you know, and I remember distinctly saying to him, "You owe me one. You owe me one for that." Uh, and uh, so, um, if it, if 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 it's okay for you, ladies, we're going to in, into the second part um, of of when of when the cardiac arrest starts. Any questions for you about your family. So we can do that now. Yes, thank you. So that'll help, it'll help you. We're trying to not interrupt you. <laughs> but go, go, go. Natasha, this would be a good time for Natasha. Go ahead and go get Thank it. you. <laughs> sure, and, and I think you did, Raymond, a fantastic job of kind of filling in some of the uh, questions that I had. Um, thank you. But what I was really curious about is um, if you have such a brilliant talent of being able to see, which is in the family, I'm curious um, why it's almost hidden and why is it not talked about freely? This is this is the question. Yeah. Great, great, great question. Um, during 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 the war, uh, mum's family was 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 persecuted. Um, so, um, my mum, my mum's family lived in a small, in a small village and, um, the policeman would often come in and, um, he, he would often stop in, always lift the lid off the pan. Mum used to tell me, try, try the soup. And so he was, he was a good family friend. And, um, and if the doctor couldn't see you, then you got sent to Frau Feiler, who was, who was my mum's mother. And, uh, and then if she, if she couldn't help you, uh, well, well, then you, you were in, in the hands of the Almighty, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so, so it was very good of, of the doctor to send these patients that he couldn't serve them up. So Granny was well known uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, for, for, her, for her scene. So in answer to your question, Natasha, what, what happened as the war progressed? Uh, Sundays was always the day for execution day in, in, in my mother's village. And, uh, and things were getting very bad for the German Jewish population at, at, at that time. It's also important to remember that my mum's brother, um, Helmut, who's now passed, he, he'd actually become a brown shirt who was, who was out persecuting the Germans as, as it was, can, can you believe? So, so everything became traumatised. Um, and it got to such a point where my, my granny used to go out to feed the prisoners in the, in the fields. And it was forbidden to do that. And uh, she got stopped one day by the by the policeman. The policeman said, listen, Frau Feiler, if we catch you feeding the prisoners, prisoners again, we'll have you shot. And uh, so this started to close everything down. Now, there was a member of my family called um, Heinz Ruhmann. Heinz Ruhmann was a, a very famous German film director during the 40s. And um, so there's there's pictures of of uh, there's a picture in Anne, Anne Frank's house in Amsterdam where where she hidden. There's a picture of him on the wall there, Heinz Ruhmann. Uh, well, Heinz Ruhmann was was like a mini Schindler. So if it wasn't for for Heinz Ruhmann, we probably wouldn't be here now. So the the seeing side of things was was kept quiet. Uh, you know, it wasn't wasn't spoken about. Um, it was something that was just kept between members of the family. Um, Heinz Ruhmann had, he had personal connections with, with, if you were somebody within the Third Reich, Heinz Ruhmann knew you. So in, there's pictures of my uncle with Adolf Hitler, Goebbels, you, you know, all of them, uh, you know, they'll, they'll be on the film set with him. Uh, the, so he, he kind of kept us all alive. Um, the family were put to work in, in uh, the lives were saved, but they were put to work in granite mines. 
and um, my grandfather was an architect. Um, I can't remember what my granny used to do herself, um, but um, so this is why it was very quiet. So, in 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 also in in answer to your question, Natasha, I thought naively up until probably my early twenties that everybody was a seer. I, I thought that everyone could could do that. It was like it wasn't spoken about within my family. Um, I understand now, you know, being with the roles of being a counselor, I understand denial um how everything is compartmentalized you know the trauma keeps keeps you quiet so this, this i didn't even know my mother was german until probably a, a jew probably until early 1990s uh so it didn't it, you know i i couldn't have been probably i was one of the ones who didn't have a good word for for Jews, I, I was caught up within that anti-Semitism, that that madness. So that'll tell you how much it was silenced within within, within my family. And um, in, in, if you go into a German, into into a Jewish person's house, you see a little scroll nailed to every do door. And uh, we moved home. We went in. We actually ended up in a Jewish person's home. And I remember pulling these things off the door frames. My mum being dreadfully upset about them. This is how naive I was. And um, so when, when I finally, when my sister did the research and we started finding out like, oh my goodness, now it all makes sense. Now I know my mum never spoke about what had gone on, you know, she never spoke about, only between very quietly about, you've got to be careful about who you speak to. You know, this is something that you can't, you can't tell everyone about, you know, if you have to keep it to yourself, keep it to yourself. And, and that, that was kind of how, how, it, how, it, how it was, Natasha, to be honest with you. It was like a real secret. Uh, so it shocked me a lot when it came out that, uh, and you know, my mum has sisters as well. So everybody else, you know, it, it was the persecution that, that kept us quiet, to be honest. Um, besides that being very shocking mm -hmm. for you, and it's about trauma in families, uh, generational trauma, and yours, personal trauma. And you, even though you didn't know all that at the time, you had to, f did you feel like everyone's childhood, there was that much tra trauma and secrecy? And do you think that started your trauma? Uh, I, I think, I, I think the trauma was on an epigenetic level. I think, I think it got, I think it got passed down. Pops was also an army man and he, he served in Malaya, Borneo, um, you know, as a military policeman, you, you know, during, during the war, Africa, Tripoli, um, Singapore, India. So he'd, he'd been in some major campaigns. He was a tough Irishman. Didn't you know? Didn't believe in expressing his feelings. So it's, it all got bottled up. Um, I could, and then obviously I got two brothers who joined the army. Um, so they were the, in Northern Ireland with, with the troubles that had gone on there, uh, with all the bombings and the murders. Um, so it, my, my family was, you know, and I, and I say this in the most loving way, was a very traumatized family. Um, and, and now knowing what I know, I, I, I can I can see why now. Uh, and um, so, you, you know, I think it had a real effect when my event happened uh, because of the trauma. Uh, and, um, I think you know, I think it, that survivor's guilt that that comes with surviving something like this, and you know, the ripples of it. So, um, but as as um, that's probably about the only only thing that I could say about 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 the trauma side at at the moment it, it, it i think it ran through all of us to be honest um you know many of us have not had time to develop these skills which which does take an awful lot of time i, I must admit now we're going to go into the the second part of the interview uh, the uh, raymond's actual night of his his trauma his other trauma his death <sighs> that yep. i still struggle with yep um, that, do your best uh, and if it's raymond it, it do your best because thank you, you know, thank, I, you, thank I you i understand i you know i drowned i died and i i get how when you say it time after time after time you're reliving it and people think it's just an interview so we understand that it's in your, thank it's you. in your on the cellular level so you take your time thank you uh, um so i'd spoken to mum told her that i was going to die who who told you the voice. Um, I have a sound room at the top of my garden. I play play guitar very badly. 
and uh, but, but I love listening to music too more more than you know that that's my medium for for my meditation escapism that that that's what I do and um I remember being up in the sound room on a Sunday night and um having my usual couple of bottles of cider had a real passion for chocolate peanuts and raisins uh, and um so those are my little treats. I walked down to the house with my cat and uh, climbed into bed. Um, I was working at a bodybuilder's house at the time and we were discussing exercises and he gave me some exercises, chest exercises. And, um, I started doing these on a, on a Wednesday. I had to go back and finish up a job with him on a Saturday, finish up plumbing his washing machine or something. And he asked me, how did you get with those exercises? His name was, you know, it was Martin, really big bloke. I said, oh my, I said, yeah, yeah, I, I did them. I said, but I'll tell you something, man. I said, my, my chest is, he said, did you warm up? And I went, no, and he, he used a few expletives and said, well, you make sure you warm up next time. I went, oh, okay. So uh, I've, I've, I've turned everything off Sunday night. Um, it was about half past 11. Um, I've gone up to bed and uh, my cat, Mr. B, curled up on the sofa downstairs. It was his normal place. I went up to bed and uh, I turned over and I had um, chest pains. And I thought, it's just because you haven't, what Martin said, you haven't warmed up. This is, uh, so I, I, I got out of bed and I, I did some press ups down by the side of the bed and uh, it must have opened up the main artery of my heart uh, and I felt amazing got back into bed and oh, right, get ready for work in the morning I, I lay in bed and and I, I think my heart must have stopped and uh, because I started started gasping for air uh, and I got out of bed really rapidly and I remember sitting on, on on the edge of the bed with my feet over over the bed and thinking you're you're in real trouble Raymond you know you're in real trouble and uh, I got up Walked downstairs, and it was all dark downstairs. I hit the hit the uh, the living room light, and um, I remember Mr. B looking at me, shocked, and I could literally hear him go, "You look rough," and and I remember saying to him, "I, I know, Boo, and I, I know I, I I feel really crook," and uh, and he, he's watched me. I thought something said you have to ring for an ambulance. So um, here in the UK, it's a triple nine if if you want the ambulance emergency services. And I had a cordless phone at the time, and um, I hit. I was standing up. I didn't have any clothes on. I'll never forget that. Um, I, I hit two nines, and, and my heart must have stopped about a minute before that. And I just ran out of oxygen and uh, collapsed, collapsed on the floor. And um, the next thing I remember was um, was, was this smell, like smelling salts, and, um, which was kind of. So I'm lying, lying on my side. Um, and I've, I thought, what's that smell? And it was my cat. He was, it was Mr. B. He was licking my nose. Uh, and um, I, I, I remember trying, doing a quick, why am I on the floor? What, what's, what's going on here? Um, noticed the phone in my hand and managed to hit the last nine. Got through to the operator. And uh, hey, how can I help you? you know, what services do you require? Ambulance, please get through to uh, the ambulance department, what's up, tell us what's wrong with you, I've got devastating chest pains, can't breathe. Uh, and um, uh, She said, stay where you are, like, you know. Um, and, um, it was getting up about 10 to 12 at about this time. And uh, I live in a small town, um, closes about nine o'clock, uh, so you can hear everything. And um, I, um, I remember sitting on the sofa after I got changed, I had this real thing about, I can't go into the ambulance with the funny things you think about. I can't go into the ambulance nude, I just can't do that. So I remember being, being on the phone to the, uh, to the, to the paramedic. Uh, and she said, you are sitting down, aren't you? But I didn't tell her that I was, I was upstairs going through my wardrobe, get my t-shirts, I'm trying to get dressed while I got one hand on the phone, like, you know, uh, not, not realizing, you know, staggering around. And, um, I came back downstairs, sat on the sofa with, with Mr. B. The, the paramedic was still talking to me. She said, leave the front door open. She said, they're on their way. And I could hear the siren off in the distance. And I heard them pull up outside my house. And uh, I, I watched them walk in, a man, a man and a woman. Uh, the woman's called Rebecca. I, dreadful, I've forgotten his name. And uh, they walked me out. 
and um, but being quite a fit bloke, used to cycle, do 45 miles a week plus fitness stuff. Um, I felt like I was 100. You know, each step was tiny, um, and the pain that, that I had was something which and, and couldn't breathe. That was the worst thing. And uh, they walked me to the back of the ambulance. I took one step, two steps in the back. They laid me down on the gurney. And I'm lying on the gurney, like really puffing and panting. And um, the paramedic was quite, she was quite firm with me. She said, you, 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 you better start breathing. She said, your, your blood levels, oxygen levels are down to 26%. And I remember thinking, 26%? I should, I should be dead. Um, and so she, she, um, I, I, I couldn't breathe. Donna, Natasha, I couldn't breathe. And um, she turned her back to me. And uh, I remember having this thought, if ever there was a time to check out, now's the time to check out. And I gave up, I suppose. That, that's the word I'm looking for. I just gave up, put my chin on my shoulder, and I was on the other side. I was a little soul, about four feet in height, sexless, uh, not, not a stitch of clothing on. Um, I, I, I remember standing there and thinking, you've been here before. And, and I knew I'd been here before uh, because of the people who I'd met later on. And I can only assume it was one of those moments where I, I stopped breathing that, that my ex-partner would, would, would have mentioned to me. And um, So I'm standing there knowing that I've died um, and waiting. And the first thing that greeted me was the wind. Um, it, it, it ran through me and it was, it was almost, it gave the, the, it was like a, do you know the heat that you get off off a wood stove burner that that you only get from a solid fuel appliance? That's what the wind was like. It had that kind of warmth that ran through me. Um, and as it as it went, I felt relaxed. And I remember looking down at my toes and, and looking at the grass. The grass was 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 as soft as cat's fur. And I, I remember scrunching my toes of how it went in between my toes and how beautiful it felt and uh, I, I, I remember like thinking oh, I'm, I'm looking at my toes um, and, and I was aware that I died and I distinctly remember I know I've said this so many times in all my other videos but it always comes up I remember thinking I wonder where I go to get my wings and it was a, it was a peculiar feeling and, and with all of this going on, I looked at the sky and, uh, and uh, just up, 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 up ahead in, in the distance was two men and three women. And they were really tall. Uh, that was one, one thing I, I, I remember. They, they, they looked human. Uh, they were wearing white togas. The women had white head scarves on. And um, I, I, I felt that through telepathy that they're going to talk to me. And so two men, three women, the first woman turned and looked at me and smiled. The second woman turned past her and she looked and she smiled. And the third woman did exactly the same. But the two men haven't spotted me yet. Uh, one man looked like Santa Claus and another man just looked at much younger than him, about 40. He had a beard too. And... Um, the first woman said to the man who looked like Santa Claus, who had a, a brown tanned book in, in his hand, she would, led to him and said, Raymond's here. And the next thing I remember is moving forward to the guy with the tanned book. And I'm now, it's almost like floating. I'm, I'm at his shoulder height. And um, he didn't even look up from the book. All I heard him say with a movement of his hand, he shouldn't be here. And he did that. And the next thing, I'm back. I'm, I'm back on the gurney in the back of the ambulance. And in British ambulances, we have, um, we have a, a red LED clock, which was to my left. And um, I, I, don't, I didn't know what they'd done to me up until that point, other than uh, they, they clearly brought me back. So they'd resuscitated me and I'd, I'd woken up and I had this real sense of guilt. Like, you know, I shouldn't have done that. And uh, she, 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 I propped myself up and, and I looked up at Rebecca and, uh, and I said, I'm really sorry about that, Rebecca. She said, why, why are you apologising? She said, oh, I was just on the other side there. She said, do you go on the other side a lot? 
I said, yeah. I said, I come from a family of seers. Well, if, if you park park up, I'll make you a cup of tea and I'll tell you all about it. She, Because I, I didn't know they'd resuscitate me. And, uh, she, she leant over me and she flicked the red LED clock. She said, you died, Raymond. We're still outside your house. She said, um, you died. And she flicked the clock. She said, you died at 12 o'clock. This clock went to zero. She went, I've never seen that before. You're the first person who I've ever resuscitated. And I'm thinking, well, thank goodness you knew what you was doing. So so she says, um, I said, I, 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 I thought, nah, she's she's got it wrong. Like, you know, she, she's got this wrong. So I'll go along with it. So, you know, so, oh, okay, all right, look, don't, obviously we'll get to the hospital. She's got it all wrong. Uh, and we, we, we sped off to, to the hospital and, and where I lived at the hospital was only 10 minutes away. And um, we ended up outside there, uh, outside the hospital, just like ER. You remember the, the series ER, the doors sprang open, out, I bounced in, in, in the back of the gurney. And, uh, you know, everyone's like telling them, you know, which I felt a bit objectionable. Oh, yeah, he's, he's 47. I thought, well, you didn't ask me if you could tell me like, how old I was. It's like, you know, telling me what, what, what had happened. I thought it was an invasion of my privacy. I remember the, I remember the, the um, fluorescent lights going over my head as, as if we went off to the, uh, to the ER room. And uh, I was totally bewildered. Total thought. I thought this is just a, this is a, I mean, you know, I've done lots of LSD, you know, so it, it, it was, I thought this is just a bad trip. This is, this will all be over before you know it. And, um, but when I got into that ER room and they were all waiting for me, phew, wow, it was like light, light blue touch paper and stand well back. It was like, it was at that point, this, I remember being flat out on the gurney, exhausted. And uh, this little Irish lady, she came down at eye level to me and she said we need your next of kin's telephone number mm -hmm. and and i remember thinking what and, and i turned my head and i looked at her and i went am i that bad she went yeah we, we're not sure you're going to make it raymond really <laughs> and i looked at the clock and my mom was very ill she was just starting the very beginnings of alzheimer's and uh so I remember looking at the clock and I thought, I can't, I can't, I can't have them ringing her up and saying, you know, he's close to death. You better get up here. It was a good 50 miles away. And uh, she just couldn't have done it. So I, I said, look, if I don't make it, then tell her, like, you know, but, but don't contact her unless I don't make it. She's, she's frail. She's old. And um, I, I waited. I, I waited and um, I, I watched something come from my right hand side it was like a smudge um it came from behind some of the some of the trolleys things that they had all the meds on and um, i was aware that the defibrillator was coming out again and uh, that really hurts the defibrillator is something else like you know and um it, that that's what really feared me the most was was you're not going to use that defibrillator on me again uh, and uh, but unbeknownst to me, when you have a cardiac arrest, and I found out later on um, through the head of resus at, at the hospital who I, who I worked with later on further down the line, uh, was some of the drugs that they pump into you uh, uh, create all sorts of psychosis. And uh, some, some don't survive from, from the meds that, that are actually given to them. Uh, some have to be put back into a coma because when they're brought back around, what they're experiencing, they have to be put back to sleep. So, so there's, there's an awful lot that, that goes on that you don't see, but has profound effects on you further down the line. So I waited, I watched this black smudge, and bearing in mind that I knew I was different already from, from a seer's viewpoint. I, I knew what I was seeing, what I was seeing. And then I'd already been experienced death in the ambulance. And now, you know, the, the Irish crash nurse said to me, you know, you, you might not make this. And I uh, watched the smudge come around and it came around to my left hand side. And uh, I felt, I felt myself, and I've got, I've got no shame in saying this. I, I remember soiling myself. I, I distinctly remember that. Lost all control of bodily functions. Um, I felt my lifeblood running out of me I felt starting to feel cold um and then they started working and um that was when it, it went from something beautiful to something which I, I found it was like a scene out of a Christmas carol um but a, a, a lot more in in your face um I 
I remember just blacking out. Just, just that was like the second one. Second cardiac arrest. I, I remember falling back into my body. Uh, I remember coming back into my body with a real splash. Um, I remember being defibrillated again. Um, that bringing me round. I, I remember fighting the staff. Um, I remember playing a joke on them uh, when, when they when they re the dark sense of humour when they resuscitated me. I, I thought I'd come up like one of those cadavers in the horror movies. I came up bolt up, upright and pointed <laughs> my finger to all of them. And I, I remember swearing. Uh, I remember saying the f word and that, that I effing needed that and uh, crash crash back down. Um, gone gone again um i remember before i went off to santa barbara a guy from california um came with his wife to see me here in england he had a brain tumor and i was already a registered healer by this time with with the with the healing trust here in the uk uh which allows us to work in hospitals it gives us the the credibility as a healer to, to work in hospitals and uh, so i'd already passed that with the healing trust and i met a guy called fred fred matman that's another story and uh, he's has a huge connection to, to to my experience so um i met california dave as i called him on the other side i went to a place called the gray which um i hadn't known about until a, a guy interviewed me called uh, tim tobias uh, and uh, i remember that being this tiny soul and it was like um, a football stadium had uh, an event had finished and everyone was shuffling out of the event shoulder to shoulder everything was gray just different different tones of gray and i remember being next to, to dave looking up and i i felt myself levitate and as i was levitating i've got to eye level with him face to face he's gone to me ray what are you doing here and I went, I don't know, Dave. I know I'm not supposed to be here. He said, you shouldn't be here, which was the second time I'd heard that. You know? And as I got to a certain height, I was able to look over everyone's heads. And there was hundreds of people shuffling along in, in one direction. And, and I met the wind, and the wind was the complete opposite to what I'd met the first time. It was, it was like, a, like a, a crackling whip of carbon. And as it cracked over people's heads, it poof, it puffed, you know. And I remember rising up above and feeling this peculiar clamminess of, of my body. And um, again, I, I, I felt I, f I felt my nose back on the ceiling tile, the white ceiling tiles. It had all of the little pimples on it. And I, I remember distinctly saying to myself, "I'll never forget the ceiling tiles." And I came crashing back in, into my body again. They defibrillated me again. But this time, instead of leaving for another place, I was I stayed in the ER room, but as a soul. Um, and I ended up sitting on my forehead. And uh, I watched the crash team work all around me. And um, I remember one man in particular, his, his name was... I think it was Brian or Tom, one of the two, or Barry, sorry. He, he, he came to see me the, pre, the next morning. Um, but at the time when I was in the ER room, I'm, 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 a, I'm a naked soul sitting on my forehead. And I remember on the balls of my feet how cold my body was feeling. And I looked at the staff and they was doing whatever they were doing to me. And I, I remember Barry saying to the rest of the staff, we were well into it by this time and uh, to, to them saving me um he had the defibrillator paddles and and he, he 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 did this he said if this doesn't bring him round nothing will bring him round uh, you know? and i remember looking at him thinking he doesn't know that this is really going to hurt he doesn't know what a defibrillator does and he hit me with this defibrillator and i remember my soul going back into my body and I remember waking and uh, it's, everything stopped. It was like the wind had stopped. It was just all the eye of the storm. And um, it, it was as if nothing was wrong with me. That's what, what I found so bizarre. 
and I've, I've looked at the Irish nurse who asked me right from the word go, and I managed to look at the clock. Uh, you know, so this has been going on for almost just almost an hour and a quarter. They've been like saving me, and um, they everyone looked exhausted. That was something that I found really, and that it brought me an amazing, an amazing sense of guilt, survivor's guilt. You did this, Ray. You, you did this to these people. You traumatized them. You fought them. You punched them. Uh, you you kicked them off. Uh, and all they were trying to do was save your life. And then the, the Irish woman just said, "I smiled." And she went, I can't do our Irish accent, but she said, you've got, a love, you've got a lovely smile. She said, and it's nice to see it. She said, it's good to have you back. And I said, I, fit. I said, is, is it over? She said, yeah. She said, we're going to put you onto the, uh, onto the intensive care unit. So I got wheeled onto there. Uh, they, they didn't give me morphine by that time. Uh, and uh, so I was lying, lying on the ICU bed at, at uh, three, four o'clock in the morning. And I remember somebody else coming in who had every beeping machine you can imagine. She got wheeled on, onto the ward. And they, she was the same age as me. And I thought, oh my God, this must be like a theme. You know, people who have heart issues, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe they all go at a set time at night. You know, she looked like a ship in the night, you know, they, they kind of glide by. I remember like watching this and thinking, uh, so morning, morning came. I'm, I'm as high as a kite. They give, they give me the clicker. You know, I can I could administer. They said just click the button if you feel any pain. Um, I, I, I think I used it all within five minutes, and I was just 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 like. Phew. And um, the next thing I see was the paramedic Rebecca. She finished her shift, and she coming with another female paramedic. And they they walk, as she walked towards the bed, I, I heard her say to a friend, "Here he is." I don't know how he's still alive. How is he still alive? And and they stood by my bed, and she said, "We we she said, you're, you're incredible." She said, "You're incredible. You don't understand the the synchronicities that went that we went through for you to be here." She went, "It's just she said you're almost like a lottery winner." Uh, she said, "The odds that you survived are just incredible. We were parked around the corner from you, having a break. Otherwise, you wouldn't be. We would have been coming to like you know a cold body, or wouldn't have found you for hours. Because you know, I, I lived on my own, other, other than my cat. And uh, so uh, she she wished me all of the best. And then the one that was the most striking to me was Barry. He came he came back in the morning, and uh, the one who rubbed the defibrillators together." And as he walked towards me, he swore. And, uh, but he was, he was, he had this big smile on his face. He went, you, he went, you are effing well something else. He went, you are bizarre, mate. He went, he went, the things you were doing last night. He went, we haven't seen anything like that before. Never, never. He went, he went, he went, you're, you're virgin on the miraculous. He went, he went, we, we can't believe you're here. No, can we not believe you're here? He went, but you're not dribbling. He went. We don't understand. Can't, I don't understand how you how how you've made it. He went. I'm glad you've made it. He went. He went. But you know. So so it was it was um, you know. But I'd lost everything. I'd lost in that hour. I'd lost everything. I'd lost who I was. Uh, um, you know the grief of, of losing who you are is is is, is you you would have experienced that. It's, it's like you're not yourself anymore. Um, you know, people, people didn't you know, talk later on. I don't, don't know who you are, Raymond. Who, who are you? Uh, you know, I didn't recognize my family when they all came up, but they came up a couple of hours in, in the morning. Uh, bless them. And, and I, you know, I, live, I lived a lie. I lived a lie. They said, Your family's here. And I thought, Family? I've got a family. Um, and, you know, they were shown in. They're all at the bottom of my bed. Mum's crying. My sister's. Just like you know, mess. My brothers are there. You know, his wife's there. Um, I, 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 you know, I, I, I lived that life for for years that that I recognised, and the connection was gone. It was it was just gone. You know? So it was something which I, I, I found quite painful. And there's nobody there to tell us. You know, when you come back from that, you know, what's 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 that like? So it was a it was a very very troubling experience um to you know, why did i survive that was you know, how, how how did i survive it was um it was an, an incredible experience wouldn't change it for the world um but, but 
made me into the person I am today. Um, I'm, I'm pleased with where I'm at with things, but that was that was a roller coaster ride, ladies. That's, that's that was whew, hold on time, very 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 traumatic. And th thank you, Raymond, for being able to hang in there with us because you can I, you can, I can feel the trauma through the hmm. screen. I can feel the, your trauma. Yeah. So that was very brave of you. We're gonna let, as you're drinking water. Uh, Natasha has, I think, about 15 questions. <laughs> Far away, Natasha. <laughs> because you and I have NDEs. Yeah. And what Natasha brings is that fresh view, that curiosity. You know, the Raymond, time. the three people who you initially, maybe not even in initially, but who you've seen, um, have you ever seen that group again? Yeah. One man in particular. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I um, I mentioned his name, Fred, Fred Matman. Um, um, in actual fact, Natasha, um, one, of the, one of the recurring things, and I'm assuming that's when my heart stopped and I was on the other side. I remember one event meeting um, two of the women um, and one of one of the gentlemen, and the the, the gentleman who didn't look, who, who was the youngest, when I met him before I had my main issue, uh, um, I remember being on a, on on a London Underground train, and nobody spoke, and the train was packed, and it stopped in the middle of the countryside, in the most vivid greens that you can imagine. The colours were just magical, and the doors opened, and everybody looked at me. So it was me who had to get off, but everybody was in this gray color. I was the only one who was in color and everybody else was, was gray. What that meant, I, I don't know. So I jumped off, went down this grass embankment and ended up at a river, the most beautiful river you can imagine. Beautiful, beautiful white homes, just, just incredible. And this man appears, he goes, hello Raymond. He went, where have you been? We haven't seen you in ages. I went, I've been really busy. Uh, I said, that's why, I, you know, um, we went, it's great to see you. I, I walked down by the river and, and I, 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 I'd seen he, he, one of the two women and they just smiled. And I remember speaking to a swan, the swan was talking to me and I noticed a bridge over the river. And I, I, I felt compelled to walk to this bridge. And I, I walked to this bridge. It was one of those lovely kind of Japanese style red, red bridges. And, and there was this there was this bloke looking out over the distance. And as I got to him, it, it turned out he was me. It was me who was on the bridge. Uh, and uh, and then and then I, I must have started breathing again and, and poof, that was it. So getting getting back to your question again is is the next person who I had met was was one person. I went to, to the doctors. I had chest pain. Didn't think about going straight to ER. I thought I'd go to the doctors. Went to the doctors, spoke to the receptionist. Uh, can I help you? Yeah, I said, look, you know, I've had a cardiac arrest a couple of, a couple of days back. I've got chest pains again. And uh, she's like looked at me. And um, as she's looked at me, I, I remember just blacking out. Dum, and I just crashed out and I collapsed on the, on the floor. Um, got brought back around again, the old GTN spray under the tongue. And it kicks the heart back into life. And I got blue lighted back to the hospital spent three or four days at the hospital that saved my life and um they, were, they couldn't work the, the, the procedures that they needed to do to me they couldn't do at this hospital so they were waiting for st thomas's hospital on the river thames right opposite the houses of parliament uh, you know beautiful hospitals been there since the, there's been a hospital there since roman times so, you know so 70 bc or something like that there's been a hospital there and um, so I'm at this world famous St. Thomas's Hospital, the Heart Hospital, and um, I've, got, I've, got, I've got dropped off there by patient ambulance three or four days later. Uh, I, I meet one of the nurses. She said, we haven't got a bed for you. And I said, if you want to just hang around, uh, um, she'll make sure you get something to eat, but we'll find you a bed. She comes back to me. We've got a bed for you up on the eighth floor, okay? I, 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 shuffle off with, with 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 this lady get up onto the eighth floor she shows me to this four bedder unit and um there's an engineer to my left a marine engineer there's another guy to my right 
Um, there's my empty bed over to the far right, and there's a, another bed which has got the curtains around it, uh, you know. And uh, I thought, wow, what, a, what, what a great view. You can look over the River Thames, the Houses of Parliament. Oh, amazing. Uh, you know, I can see Big Ben. Uh, and uh, I, 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 I'll shuffle to my bed and I, and I sit on the edge of my bed and I'm trying to contemplate why am I here? Like, you know, like just exhausted with it all. And um, I could hear this voice from behind the curtains. And it was a man's voice. And the man's voice says, oh, yes, oh, yes, I'm a, I'm a, a vicar too, Paul. That, that, that's unusual. And um, went went back after about five minutes, and in the bed was the man who looked like Santa Claus. But before the Kearns went back, I, I I heard Fred say to the to the padre or or the vicar, "Oh yeah, oh yeah, vicar." He said, "I write poetry too," uh, you know, and. Um, I, I thought, oh, okay, this will be interesting. Well, the curtains went back, and it's the Santa Claus, the guy who I'd seen on the other side. And in his hand, he had the same brown book as I'd seen on the other side. And that was that was his that that was his poems. I, you know, that's what he's. This 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 man was in D Day. He landed on the beaches of Normandy. He was in he was in he was in the conflict of Monte Cassino. He, in, in Italy, he was with his platoon and they was outside the church of St. Francis Assisi. And one of his platoon leaders said, hey, up, Fred, you've got a white feather on, on your boot, which is the dove of St. Francis Assisi. They couldn't get into the church because, you know, war was on. And, um, and from that moment on, Ted, Fred, had, had become very special. He worked with Harry Edwards, uh, you know, the great, the great healer, Harry Edwards, and the two used to work together. So the curtains had gone back priest has walked off I'm sitting there looking at the bloke who I'd seen on the other side with this tan book uh, and um, and I, 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 I heard Fred say to the padre I'm a healer too padre he said I'm I'm a spiritualist and um, off he walked and I heard all of this and I'd, I've looked over to him and I couldn't help myself I was I was very unprofessional. I said I couldn't help but hear you say that you're a healer, mate. I went, so am I. I said I'm a registered healer with with the Healing Trust, and it turns out that he knew people that I knew, uh, you know. And uh, he started asking me about my techniques. How how do I how do I work? And um, there was a German nurse on 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 the ward, and she had picked up that the two of us were were healers, spiritual healers, and. Um, I think Fred at the time was 82, something like that. And he was in for heart, heart issues too. And uh, so she, when she used to come on, 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 onto the unit, she smiled and she'd say in this German accent, well, isn't it so beautiful that we have the two healers on the ward at the same time? What, what? Uh, and I used to think, yeah. So it took me four days to get under this man's skin. Um, and, and when I did, Natasha, Oh, he was, he was, he was something else. He, he, he didn't have long to live. And he called me over one day, told me about his past. And he said to me, they're going to do tests on me uh, in, in a couple of days time. He went, uh, what, what I want to know, Ray, is, is am I going to survive? Because I told him I was a seer. And, uh, and he, he went, yeah, yeah. He said, I, I can, I can see you are. Uh, and uh, he says, so I'm going to ask you, am I going to survive? And I stood next to his bed. And I remember looking down at him, and I had my own little drip with me, and um, I, I held his hand. And when he asked me that question, I couldn't answer him because I knew he he wasn't going to survive. But I, I just looked down at him, and uh, he looked up at me, and he he moved his hand backwards and forwards. And um, you know, bearing in mind some of the things he described of the D-Day landing and that were just just horrific. Uh, and uh, he looked up, and he had the, he, he had these tears in his eyes. And he went, he went, it's all right. It's all right, Ray. He said, he said, just remember that you can't save everyone. He went, I want you to remember that. And I spent nine days with him. And it was, it was the, the things that, that, that we, you know, um, I, I, again, I, um, I, I'd kind of given up really on the amount of times that I died. Um, uh, it, it is, it's more than 10 um, yeah, because I went again in St. Thomas's. 
Um, but I became so exhausted with it that I just didn't want to add to it. So this is probably one of the really first times that I've ever really said that um, on top of six other heart attacks in 2018, 19, uh, over the Christmas period. So, you know, so yeah, I, I, I had, I had met him. I had met somebody from the other side and, uh, but he didn't survive. Um, and, and, and an amazing man told me an awful lot about who I, who I, who he believed I was, um, what, what, what I could do, how I should practice. He asked me when I do healing, how do I do healing? And, you know, the, my mother taught me I always leave a thumb off. If you can wash out whatever you take, and um, there he was telling me the exact same thing. You know, you know, make sure you 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 you, know, you, you clean. How do you how do you get rid of it? Uh, and he said, yeah, that's it. He said, you've got it. You, you've got it. He went, um, always, always, always be honest. He went, always be honest. Help as many as you could. So it was wonderful to see Natasha. He was an, an amazing, an amazing man. Uh, I had I had met I had met him before. I've met others before. But that would be that would be another story. But yeah, for, for him, he I never met the women. Um, I never met the other the other person. Um, it was it was all I all I see was was the guy who looked like Santa Claus. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, I do have I know my, really mind blowing, really mind blowing. Thank you. Uh, I have a question. Do you have yes. any thoughts about the gray? What is the gray? Where? What was that, the gray, when you went? And and tell me about the wind. Why was it the opposite in this gray sort of um, environment? What was that? I think the only thing that I'm, um, for me, because of the lifestyle that I led, um, I, 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 th I think it was, I think it was a reminder of this is this is where you can be if if you don't change. This is where you. This how it's why why it reminded me of a Christmas Carol. It had so many similarities. It was almost like um, we're gonna we're gonna show you where you can end up. You, you've seen you know paradise as I'd seen it, heaven uh, if you want to call it that. So I think I went. Um, and, and and I think the grey was the opposite. The grey was was there was uh, Natasha. No one spoke, other than, than Dave. He, he, he was um, and Dave was his tumour uh, when he came to see me. Um, it was already advanced. He knew he didn't have long to live. Um, he actually came to see me because he wanted extra time to live. So that's how much people thought th about the power that I had uh, or stroke have. Um, and, and and he did he did he did I remember his wife contacted me and said you know thank you for giving him the time we managed to see everybody, but for the for the grey I found the grey. I don't know where it was, I I know that it was the exact opposite of where I was, first time round. Nothing nothing was it was a place where I would not want it to have spent any more time than I did there. It felt really cold. Um, People were so unhappy. People were really tall as well. And that's been a theme. Uh, I mean, even dreams that I have now, you know, the very tall people. Even when I used to, before I died, when I was a child, you know, the first white, white, luminous beings I'd seen were really, really tall. Uh, and uh, but, but I, I don't understand the, the connection of that. But, but I, I do know that um, when I was interviewed by Tim Tobias, um, he, he said it's very rare for people to talk about the grey uh, and uh, he said not not everybody's been there he said I've interviewed a few who have he went but not many uh, and uh, he said what do you like you Natasha he said well, what do you think it was I said it, it wasn't a place I'd want to go back to it was um, it was I think the purpose of me going there to keep me boundary to keep me in the right direction um but for me, it was almost, I know some don't agree, but for me, it was almost a form of punishment. No, I was going to say, um, thank you for that. Um, Natasha, do, do you have, did that help? Yeah, Im immensely, of course. Of course it did. So from, I just have a quick question. Yes. Did, um, did Fred recognize you from the other side? That's a great question. I hadn't thought of that. I, I don't think he recognized me personally. 
yeah. as in it's Raymond, it's Raymond O'Brien like that we, yeah. we, we, we met before, but I do think that he recognised what I was. That, he that's, your, that's, yeah, yeah, yeah. He recognised your soul. I think I think he did. Um, I knew I knew that even with everything, all the damage that the event had done to me, I knew that I'd came I'd come back more skilled than I did before I left. This is the end of part one. We'll be doing the after and now portions of the interview on part two on Friday. Thank you. Thank you for listening to today's podcast. We publish our Exploring Consciousness podcast on the Monday, Wednesday, and Friday of the second week of every month. Please check the podcast schedule and more on our companion website, exploreconsciousness.com. Thank you again for listening.